Welcome to UNAM Chicago's Cafe Expresso, a space for bilateral conversations with people from all walks of life. Tune in to Spanish Public Radio and follow us on social media. And now your host, Alberto Fonserrata. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Cafe Expresso. Today I'm very happy that uh, a friend of mine is joining. Uh, I want to introduce my friend Regan Berg. She's the author of In That Number, uh, a book released in October, and she's going to tell us all about it. So please help me welcome Regan Berg. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Alberto. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So I love the background on your place. Are you in uh, in your uh, confinement? I'm in my confinement. I'm sheltering in place. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody gave me this beautiful. This is real. Look at this the emerald oh, wow. Christmas, and it bloomed this week. So great week for it to bloom. Inauguration week, right? I know. Exciting, yeah. exciting week. Well, we'll we're we're going to talk about this, but uh, well, first of all, I wanted to talk to. I, I wanted to talk to, to you about, about your book released in October. Uh, I know that the editor is a common friend of ours, Jerry Brennan. I love Jerry. And um, the book is fascinating. I haven't read it. It's still in my shelf, but it's absolutely a must read. And I, I've seen the reviews and I've seen some of the interviews you have done. Uh, but why don't you just walk us through a little bit of what it's all about? I know it's... Um, well, your story it's, itself is an open book. I know you're a, a flower child and a <laughs> Vietnam protester, and we've actually uh, been to, to the streets of Chicago protesting stuff. So <laughs> yeah. why, don't you, why don't you take us through, through a little bit of what the book is about? There's some circles where people think of me as very progressive and liter li uh, liberal, and there's other circles of friends, right, political friends, where... I'm not thought of so much as that because I'm more or less like you in a way that in conversations we've had, um, you know, um, a thinker more than a follower actually. But um, my story is um, a, a big story about alcoholism and drug addiction. And I, I came from a very alcoholic Irish Catholic family. Um, And uh, so I write about that in my book, you know, a little bit about my parents and, 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 my, and my heritage, um, which I, uh, until recently, actually, um, really about the past five years, uh, I, I haven't actually recognized how important my heritage is. Mm -hmm. And I think that I've recognized how important my heritage is as an Irish American, really, you know, full blown, 100% Irish blood in me um, until, um, until, I became, until I became aware of other people's heritages like yours, you know, uh, particularly the immigrant stories and the immigrant heritage. And I would think to myself, well, I come from an immigrant family too. What's that all about? So, so I really researched a lot about the Irish diaspora and, um, and my family, which my family was ashamed of their heritage, of their Irish heritage until, well, they always were, they really anglicized themselves, which is easy to do when you look like me, you know, when you look like my family, um, even though we went to, you know, Catholic schools were racist Catholics, that sort of thing, but, but they never talked about being Irish, right? And, and that is a common in my generation for, for parents of that generation. So, uh, so I, I wanted, I needed to research that a lot. And I was very enlightening how, you know, what happened to me as a result of it. And uh, anyway, they were both, both of my parents were very, were college educated alcoholics and um, bad. And, um, and then I became an alcoholic uh, as, uh, you know, fairly young. And, um, And, and then just drifted immediately right into being a hippie, taking a lot of drugs and um, going to protests in Washington. And I was very active politically at a pretty young age. You were in Woodstock, if I'm not mistaken, right? I, I, yeah. <laughs> so What do you remember about Woodstock? Who was your favorite, favorite well, performer? I, you know, 
I changes periodically, but I really loved Richie Havens. Mm. I love Richie Havens. And one reason is because not one, I loved him before that because we were, you know, as, as hippies, we got the first issue of Rolling Stone magazine, right? I'm 74 now. So when it came out, we were waiting for it. We knew it was coming out. We were waiting for, it. you know, you had to go to a stand and buy it, you know, that kind of thing. And we were listening to very progressive radio, right? So we, we knew those things. That that's what you did. So Fascinating. when the, when the, when it, came time to buy tickets for Woodstock. Of course, I, it was, I, I didn't know anybody. We, nobody had any money. So we had to you know, get some pot and sell pot in order to buy our tickets to go to Woodstock, which were useless once you got there. You know, They were just useless. But as my friends and I came into, <laughs> we sort of came up over a hill. The first thing we were hearing was Richie Haven. So I think the that memory of that it, it's so stunning really you know it's just something you can't forget but the you know all the rest good of thing it you have memory of that it's a, a lot of people probably because, lost their memory well the well one thing i found about about writing it writing um you come your memories come back to you right some people say this to me all the time like, how can you remember this? How can you remember that? And a way to remember things is to either go to the place, I didn't go to Woodstock, but go to different places where you lived or try to remember what you were wearing or maybe what your friends were wearing or the car that you were in. Right. If you start to remember those things, then you'll, the other memories come back, the particularness of, of the memories and the writing. And if you write it down, it starts to come back to you. People who do memoir writing talk about this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I heard you mention that in an interview. Is that the yeah. bibliotherapy that you were talking about? Well, uh, um, or is uh, that something writing, else? No, that's, that's what some people call that bibliotherapy. There's another okay. form of bibliotherapy, which is reading, you know, uh, fiction, really a fiction stories that will bring out um, a, a sort of a therapeutic conversation with you and your therapist. But the writing I call bibliotherapy, other people call it that too, be, for that very reason, you know, it really unlocks memories. And actually on the paper, you can put on the paper, you can write through that experience because a lot of the experiences that I, I have found this out because I have had in the past chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And I went, happened to go to a doctor who treated chronic pain with writing, which is how I ended up writing a memoir to begin with. And the, in the writing, what you find is you finish the emotion, right? It's not an emotion that's repressed necessarily. It's just not, wasn't ever finished. Like you didn't go all the way through with, you know, if you fell off your bike when you were three years old and hurt yourself and cried and got back on your bike and went home and never said anything. You didn't finish that emotion of feeling alone and hurt and nobody, you know, you need to finish those and you can do that on the paper and writing. Um, it's, it's very, um, it's not popular in particular, but it, it's, it works and people who do it understand that. So, uh, so that's how I started to write a memoir by doing this kind of work to begin with. And, um, yeah, so I, uh, uh, so when I, um, you know, I went full blown into drugs as a result, not as a result of being at Woodstock, but that life, you know, that got me to Woodstock. And um, it fortunately for me, it didn't last very long because, you know, I was such an addict. <laughs> I hit bottom really fast because I couldn't get enough of whatever it was that I wanted to get enough of. So I hit bottom really fast. And um, anyway, the, the, I like to tell that story because in the past, um, you know, 10 years, certainly uh, when opioids have been such a problem. And um, I have talked to a number of parents who have had problems with children or have lost children to opioid addiction. But the parents that are having problems, I'd like to tell them my story. You know, that was me. You're, you're talking about me. Right. Here I am, right? And I ended up, you know, going to work in the White House, you know, to give people some kind of hope 
that, you know, that person who you think is ruining their lives at, as a teenager or in their young 20s, you know, early 20s, there's still hope for that person. We, we don't turn out so bad, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> Fascinating. I love that you, 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 you touched on your personal story. And that's, uh, that makes the, the, the book uh, a lot more uh, attractive. And uh, that's, ha that's part of the book. But then you, you mentioned the White House. You, you yeah. were close to power. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you, you worked for, uh, I believe, Gary Hart and uh, Adelaide Stevenson and, and, and President Clinton. Right. So you were, you, you were a political junkie. You became a political junkie, too. Yeah, yeah. Very much a political junkie, and you know, uh, uh, you seek out other political junkies. You know, like there is nothing I'd rather do than sit at Starbucks and talk for hours about politics. Nothing, right? And uh, and uh, you know, the the, the it, I live in Chicago, so that's easy to do. You know, it was easy for a long time to find people. Like I became involved in independent politics and in, in Chicago and. Um, worked in a lot of, volunteered in a lot of uh, aldermanic races, you know, so I got to know Chicago pretty well because of that. And, and, and that's how I got involved, really. You know, I had regular jobs and then I would volunteer on these political campaigns. And eventually I just stopped working really and just worked for peanuts on, on political campaigns until eventually I got hired uh, to go down to Little Rock to work in, in, in Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign. And then I ended up going to Washington wow. to work with Clinton, yeah. So, so you were you worked with him as uh, in the scheduling uh, or what? Yes. Okay. Well, my, my job was the director of scheduling advance in the in initially, in the initial Clinton campaign, that was very difficult to do. Oh, yeah. Yes, I know, I, I, I've been involved in campaigns and I, I know, it. Exactly what you're talking about. Why don't you tell me a little? Uh, you have an anecdote there. I know. I remember you uh, you talking about one that uh, I guess you took him, or you you were exploring a place to take the candidate, and, and it ended up being a Hooters or something. I don't know. Well, the, <laughs> this so it's very different now. What the way <laughs> people do advance now, um, but then you know what you do is you call somebody you know, and say, I need you to do it. And you try to find somebody who's done this work before, right? right? And and so I've known people in campaigns, so I knew people, you know, and you just like beg them to leave whatever it is they're doing and go to Orlando, Florida and, and for a couple of days, right? And what they had to do was, you know, rent cars, right? With money we barely had and, and pick up the candidates and whoever's traveling with him, at the airport and bring them to an event, right? Go through the event, raise the crowd ahead of time, go through the event and take the back and do press availabilities or a press conference, whatever was going on. And with Bill Clinton, there was always something going on. So there's always, you know, you either had to avoid the press or you had to have the press. So, so he was going to Orlando when, and I it was the scheduler. So I assigned somebody to go down there Right. And and I had several people that worked with me. So one person was, you know, going through all the details, walking through. Now, you know, you could take pictures. We couldn't even we didn't have phones where you could even take pictures of sites. So, you know, what you do is you you have the advanced person walk through the entire, you know, step by step by step the entire site, and even from the airport on, you know, what are you passing along the road? You know, because Clinton also, if he saw something interesting along the side of the road, he'd want to stop, you know, get an ice cream cone or something or cheeseburger or something That's like better. that. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, um, so here we are. We have this whole thing set up in the town square, which in Orlando, you know, there's not a big downtown, but we thought, oh, OK, it's going to be downtown in downtown Orlando. And um, so I, I, I so you know, the person who's working for me went through the whole thing. So then I get on the phone, you know, it's the, like, I'm the person that signs off on this. So I said to the advanced person, just stand on the stage at the podium, look around me and describe to me everything that's around, right? And he gets to Hooters, which was brand new then, you know, I mean, I think that may have been the first one. I think it may have even started in Florida. 
I said, Hooters? What's that? Right? He said, I don't know. It's a restaurant. I said, what kind of a restaurant is that? Right? So I made him go over to the restaurant and, you know, look and see what Hooters was. Well, of course, this was Bill Clinton and he was, this was Florida and he was, our, he had already been through the Jennifer Flowers debacle and stuff like that. So we had, right. to, we had to fix that. You know, we had to move him to another site because of that, because he had press with him, you know, sure. and that would have been the story. You know, that would have been the story. So the and the and then now we're used to that kind of thing and used to those stories. And maybe we, you know, don't change a site because of those stories because people are used to it, but they weren't then. And it was I built. Know. <laughs> the yeah. things that happen the, the things that happen behind curtains always it's amaze me. And I love I love these kinds of stories. I remember once yeah. when I had a President Calderon visiting here in Chicago at the McCormick Center. And uh, I got a call from uh, Jesse Jackson and he told me he wanted to meet with the president and we already had it scheduled. Uh, so there was no time. And I, I remember I told, uh, well, I don't want to put him in the, on the spot here, but I told one of my superiors that, you know what, Jesse Jackson wants to see the, the president. And, and he was telling, he was dismissing me. And Jesse Jackson, and you know, he's pretty terrible. Yeah. And he told me, he told me, I'm going. He wouldn't take a no for an answer. So he went to, um, to McCormick Center and I had to sneak him in through the kitchen and uh, ended up having a little office somewhere. And so he met the president, I mean, but he was kind of like, oh, at the end, we, we, everything was on the press and everything, it was fine. But it's one of those, like, you have to take a decision right away. Right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> that, well, that, yeah, that's exactly right. So I, oh, I want to tell you about something that's not in the book, um, in my book, but I, <laughs> I know when I first met you, I told you this, that, um, that I had done it. I've been to Mexico City several times, which I love. I know you do. I, I, I just love it. And I'm sorry now, you know, I, I hope I get there before the end of my days again. I'm sure uh, you will. I will visit all the same places I ever visited. I mean, I just love it so much. So, but at any rate, the, the Clintons, both of them went to Mexico City, you know, sometime in the mid nineties. It was a big deal. I can't remember quite what the big deal is, but was, but I had friends from Chicago, actually. Well, I have a friend in Chicago who's married to a woman from Mexico City, and they were still living in Mexico City, and oh. I got her into a event. So my advanced job was with Hillary Clinton. So I got her into an event with Hillary Clinton, and when I see her to this day, she tells me about it. You know, she, Oh, really? They live in Chicago, yeah. Marta Berrigan, her name is. But anyway, uh, so... Here's so it was so difficult. This is something I probably never told you. So, you know, but I told you, remember that we got to see Los Pinos, which yes, you told me exactly the most beautiful place in the world. I think it is. I mean, well, now you know that Los Pinos, it's a it's a public the, the president no longer lives in Los Pinos. Los Pinos in this new administration is uh, they opened it for uh, for the public to see. Oh. Yes. Oh, so happy that. to hear that. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Not everybody's happy, but well, so, but yes, I think it's a uh, it's a beautiful place. I remember I was there for when I was a when I was a child uh, in the seventies. They took us from uh, from school for a little uh, oh. tour at Los Pinos. So I met the president Echeverria, who still happens to be alive. He's uh, ninety nine. He turned ninety nine this uh, oh. this week, I think. Oh. Yeah. So you, I didn't know that you worked for uh, no, for so, Hillary Clinton too. Well, well, what what happened? What happens? What happened in the Clinton White House is they had a group, you know, a big group of people who would do advance and you right. do him or her. So um, the there was a Clinton's lead advance person was Rick Jaskolka. Do you know him? He's a Chicago and Rick Jaskolka. He's trained like all the advanced people in the world. But okay. and I was the lead for Hillary. So, oh. and the, and me, in Mexico, it's probably still this way. It, and this is true in other countries, like in Russia, this is true. In Russia, the advanced people are KGB. In Mexico, the advanced people are military. Military, absolutely. Not anymore. Well, that's what they say, but 
it, so, it is that bands. I mean, they they kind of said it then too, but it was not true. I mean, if you weren't talking to your military counterpart, that you were, it was your whatever you're doing is useless, right? Right. So, anyway, so here's what. So the White House, well, Hillary really wanted to do this. So Hillary wanted to go to a poor section, a, a barrio. Okay. In Mexico City, and talk about birth control. <laughs> anyway, wow. they did not want her to do that, but they didn't tell me that, right? So it was so difficult because I would say the White House, so I'm meeting with so and so, and then I would tell you know Mike, the lead advance person, I can't get see, I'm not getting anywhere, and then he would have to intervene, you know, and get the right person. I would get the right person, and the right person would kind of get up. But I don't speak Spanish, so you know there was. I had an interpreter, and so the from our State Department would come, right? So that would sort of get up in the middle of the meeting and walk away, and you know just walk away, really. You know the I mean they this wouldn't allow it, and when they wouldn't say they wouldn't allow it because that would have caused you know sort of a diplomatic kerfuffle. So I was in the middle of this and I kind of knew what was going on. You know, mm -hmm. I finally called, you know, I called the first lady's office and I said, we just can't do this. We're in Mexico, right? This Catholic country. They don't want us to come down here and talk to poor women about birth control. We can't do it. Well, wow. in the end, we did it. Okay. It happened. It. Okay. That's a She's a force of nature, Hillary Clinton. I know she is absolutely, and uh, but yeah, you're right. All the theatrics that that come with uh, putting together an uh, a, a, an event and uh, and all the security people that you have to deal with. But yes, you're right. Hillary Clinton is a uh, is uh, she's got the personality. I was living in D.C. actually in the first Clinton term, and uh, I remember I went to a. Um, I think it was the Cinco de Mayo or something where the president would always meet with the Latin community. And there were both of them there and both of them addressed the audience. And when Hillary took the microphone, wow. Yeah. It's like, it's like Bill shrunk. Yeah. Cause he had a personality, he, he great yeah. personality too, but she was, especially in that first term, I remember yeah. her, she, she just captivated the audience. Yeah. Power, powerful. No notes. She, no notes. Hillary oh no, it's exactly no, right. Yeah. yeah, she was she was sparkling there. In fact, I think I can't remember what the event is, but it was probably one of those, you know, could you know, APEC or something like that. Maybe I, I'll have to look it up for you. But the uh, the you know, her press there was bigger than his. Oh yeah, <laughs> because of what she did, and she went and talked at a big um, forum that was. Well, I can't remember where it was, but you would know it. But anyway, um, the big, beautiful building on an auditorium to women, right? She was talking right. to women in Mexico in the 90s. You know, wow. I mean, it's not that Mexico doesn't have a lot of strong women because there certainly are th there um, and, and prominent. And mm -hmm. I mean, but her message was to women, yeah. period, you know? So, Last time I saw her, it was when I was in, in Ottawa. Um, that was just before the elections, uh, I was in an event in a think tank and actually the current prime minister was there, uh, Justin Trudeau. And, and we were, we had an event with Hillary Clinton and she was, she kept the audience waiting for, for quite a bit. But when she was there, she was presenting her book actually, oh. uh, which I read and it was, it was just yeah. an incredibly, uh, incredibly informed woman. And, uh, she captivated the audience too right away yeah. People did for that for that long even even the prime minister was waiting probably like good 25 minutes he wasn't the prime minister yet but anyway let's uh, let's let's get back to the present a little bit uh -huh. I, i've been reading uh this book by um doris kearns goodman uh on leadership it's pretty it's fascinating uh it's it's a, it's an account of uh Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson. So it's a very, very nice book. But with what's going on, whatever, what's your, uh, who's your, who's, who do you like? Uh, what's your favorite president, first of all? 
in your lifetime? Uh, Jimmy Carter. Oh, really? No question. Jimmy okay. Carter. Now, have you seen the CNN? Uh, no, I've seen the... the, the oh, trailer, rock and roll. But right. I really want to see it because I love rock and roll and I love Jimmy. Oh, well, you're going to love this. I I'm sure I will. Twice in a row. Um, and when I was young, you know, Jimmy Carter was running for president. And I, at the time that Jimmy Carter was running for president, I was in a born again Christian cult, believe okay. it or not. <laughs> so I did for about four or five years. And, uh, you know, it was one of the, was the period of time when I first got sober and uh, I would have done anything to right. be different from what I was. So, uh, and, and Jimmy Carter announced he was running for president and then he was a born again Christian, which I thought. I didn't, I, I really don't understand what I was doing, what I was doing, but, um, you know, and I wrote him a letter and told him I wanted to work for him. So I volunteered for him where I was, wherever it was that I was, you know, and I just became so captivated by him always. And um, oh, I just love him. I still Great love him this day, you know, and, um, and the, you know, what he's done in his post-presidency is, is, Oh, he's just uh, epitomizes decency. He's just right. a wonderful, right. wonderful guy. Right. And, and and the work he does. I mean, he's still active right. building houses and things. It's just amazing. Yeah. What, a, what, a, yeah. what a wonderful human being. I know. Now, what about today? What do you think? I mean, I don't want to talk about too much about the past, what happened the last few weeks. I think. Oh, no, I don't care. I think, I I think my mind is kind of like over that. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, right. We, we had enough. We had enough. But. Uh, yeah, but looking my forward. Favorite, my favorite thing that's going on is is Pete Buttigieg as the uh, Secretary of Transportation, and I watched his whole Senate hearing the other day, and I, I, I love him to begin with. I mean, I, I, I supported him, and when right. he ran for president, but uh, you know, who? I, it's just I love him, and I think of. I'm so happy that Biden put him in that position because. All the money, you know, Biden has this huge economic plan that's all part of the, the you know, COVID relief. Then there's the economic plan and putting people to work right. in jobs. We're going to have, you know, I, aren't you convinced it's going to be like, oh, it's, it's gonna be, yeah, it's going to be a daunting task. But I totally agree with Pete Buttigieg yeah. there. I met him when he was mayor of South Bend because I was living here in Chicago and we went to, uh, with the consul general, we went together to, to, to meet him at, at Notre Dame University and uh, such an incredible guy. I mean, he's just so knowledgeable too. And yeah, I, well, I cannot he, vote because I'm not a citizen here, but yeah. he, he probably would have been my guy. Yeah, too. well, the, he, you know, this putting people to work, all that money, all that legislation, it's gonna come through the Department of Transportation. Right. But Pete, it's going to be out in the country Absolutely. looking at broken down bridges like you know they you know those senators that were on that uh, committee the other day asked them you know even the republicans could you come and look at this right so he's gonna, he's going to be building a base out there right oh, absolutely. And, and uh and and all the money that's going to go through the department of transportation he's going to be cutting ribbons and all that stuff i mean he is going to be really out there out front as a spoke sterling spokesperson for the administration, I believe this is coming with him. And, um, you know, they are ready at the end of the campaign, we're putting him on Fox News because he can really, really outdance anybody. And mm -hmm. one reason for that, as, as you know, is because he speaks from the heart. Absolutely, he's just, he's absolutely. Just and, and you know, the, the entire team, the entire team looks like America. It yeah. actually does. I, yeah. uh, there's a lot of people familiar faces there and you can see that there's experience and basically there's decency back to the, yeah. in the white house yeah. I and mean, joe biden say whatever you want you, if you're left or right whatever the guy is a decent human being too and right. he's got experience right. and i'm sure he's gonna um, i have high, ho high hopes for for him and uh i do too i mean yeah. did you hear though uh the other night there was a before the inauguration there was a press briefing and somebody reported on it on Brian Williams, I think last night, that you know there were all these reporters on this press briefing, and one reporter asked him a question, and Joe Biden's answer was, "You guys think that I don't know what I'm doing? I've been doing this all my life, right? I know what I'm doing, right?" Absolutely, it's got like what, really 36 years. Cool, cool years 
almost like, who do you think you're talking to? I've been doing this my whole life. You know, I know what I'm doing and he does. So, and all, and all those people, I mean, he's hired people that are, as you say, you know, some of them who are people that actually hit the ground running. They're people right. who do things. It was right. very emotional to see uh, to see him uh, cry when he left Delaware, yeah. when he was headed to an, and that just made me made me happy to see a president being human again, a human yeah. being, you know, just yeah. being vulnerable, and uh, it was just great. Now, what what are you what are your thoughts about the um, the whole inauguration thing? Did you, was well, there a special the, act that you liked? I, you know, I, I was going into that day thinking, I wish they wouldn't be outside. I wish they mm. would just go inside with a couple of people, get sworn in and go to work. That's what I was thinking because right. it, 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 everything is so serious. Mm. I mean, there's so much serious work oh, to be yeah. done. Absolutely. I would just wish that they would do that. That's what I was saying to myself. Mm. But that day... So here, that, here's what that day did for me, somebody who would be, you know, somebody in some cog, you know, organizing something for that day, right? In another time, I would have been doing it. It was so organized. That's what the first, I mean, that's to me, it's so professional, so organized, you know, and uh, so beautiful and inspiring, uh, uh, you know, everything about it. Well, you know, uh, of course, the poet um, and and Lady Gaga. I thought were the oh, Lady Gaga, I, She's yes. that, Lady you know, Gaga's Lady Gaga. I know. I know. Oh <laughs> my God! So, but the but I then you know because of that day, my whole attitude shifted. It, I, I don't think this would have happened if they had just put their hand on the Bible and gone to work. You know, I it, it's the this I got this overwhelming relaxation. You know, my shoulders drop. I mean, I just re- relax. I slept well. Uh, every, I think everybody in the yeah. world slept pretty well that night. I didn't expect that. I mean, I, I, really, I, I wasn't anticipating anything like that, that it would be so fast that my own, uh, you know, demeanor would right. really shift in such a way. And I, I think it's going to, it's hard for people to sort of walk in those shoes, except you see it now on TV. They're really backing off from the negative, you know, stories. Of, well, you know. most of the time, because I mean, I, my morbid self, the other day I was kind of like playing with the channels and I went through, you know, those right wing channels and it, it was like, they were already talking about how to bring down the government. Again, yeah. You know, yeah. Like criticizing yeah. every even the mask that uh, Jill was wearing or whatever, it was oh, really? like negative. Yeah. Everything was negative. But anyways, I don't know. It's uh... Well, the, if you're watching those channels, that's going to happen. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I don't watch those ever. But uh... but the but I, I don't, you know, and I think I'm on a lot of Zoom calls with a lot of different groups. And, yeah. um, and I, when Zoom started, I said to myself and my friends, oh, I'm never learning it because... I don't need to because it's going to be over in a couple of weeks, right? And I don't want to learn anything new. Well, you know, over them. Here we are. Uh, but I have my own Zoom and help to manage several Zooms, you know, all, all kinds of different groups. So the uh, people are having a hard time stepping back from that negative. Yes. That they've had for those negative responses and negative statements that they've been making and for the last, you know, so, so I think what I told you before was that, you know, I've been spending the last 48 hours laughing at Bernie Hansen's mittens. Yeah, I know the memes. I know everybody's got. I am so glad that. I'm going to send you some of those. That they, that they're in Mexico because the, the, the Mexican ones, you, you, you got to see them. Oh, you, I would love to see them. Yeah, I'll send them to Bernie me. having some tamales and Bernie sitting in a, in a bus and, and <laughs> oh my God, it's like, the never ending story. But I am so glad that happened because it it just it got the picture or the the laughs really away That's from true. the Trump and his family memes and cartoons and stuff like that. Onto yes. something that's really not even, you know, so innocuous. You know, <laughs> did you see the one where it's, where there's a picture of Joe Biden and it says, I have mittens too? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm so glad. Uh, yes. 
really lightens the load. I know. Regan, I really appreciate your time uh, that you, you gave me. It's, it's always a pleasure. I know you and I uh, will meet again in some other street protest yeah. or maybe who knows the, the the choir the singing choir you know the, what's the name yeah. of the choir the there are there are <laughs> there are many choirs virtual but yeah, choirs but the, the choir that i the, sing the in, christmas co co choir oh sing alongs yeah the sing alongs so, uh, you know i i or i <laughs> organize two sing alongs a year one for the beatles and one for exactly. christmas carols yeah so this year we did the christmas carols online um <laughs> anyway well, Regan, I'm uh, hoping in July we'll be able to sing the Beatles. Outside. I hope so too. I hope so too. And I want to thank you again for uh, for your time. Uh, please uh, stay safe and uh, thank you. It's and really we'll we'll pleasure. be talking again. Yeah, my pleasure. I hope so. All right. Well, that is it for us. Thank you. Thank you.